Felix here, and happy Monday to you. It is a green and bushy-eyed and optimistic Monday morning. At least it is in the markets. S&P and Nasdaq both up more than 1% this morning pre-market. Uh, volatility is flat. The dollar is flat. So the world is pretty good. Pretty good and, and, and all, all around. Um, What's going on here today? Well, let's run through it. Let's run through the events that are actually going to make the market today, but of course, also tomorrow and Wednesday, because tomorrow and Wednesday are, well, what's going to decide whether or not your portfolio uh, closes somewhere in the optimistic or somewhere in the miserable. Uh, and it's so super important to be well positioned for that and, 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 and so on. So I am going to share my screen with you as I usually do and run through some of the key macro stuff here. Uh, where did it all go? Everything has moved around a little bit. No, no, no. Here it is. Yeah. And first of all, pre-market. Look at how green that looks. Isn't that lovely? Economic calendar. Tomorrow, inflation rate. Wednesday, Fed interest rate decision. And there are some little bits of news in between. Consumer inflation expectations, for example, today at 11 a.m. Eastern. And that's reasonably important. The Fed will definitely look at that. But really, I mean, we're getting core inflation. The core inflation month on month number tomorrow, that's 0 0.3. You really want that to be less than 0 0.3 if you're hoping for it for Santa's little reindeer to deliver us a rally. Uh, so that's really the, the key thing here to, to look out for. And this is the, either the trigger in, in up, up or down ways for, for the rest of the year, in, in, in my opinion. And if we look at the, let me just pull you up the pre-market here. Let's look at the heat map for stocks. Pre-market is what we want. That's where we are and get a little bit of a feel. So why are we green? Well, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, big banks and so on are looking optimistic. I mean, not it's not like a everyone's flying off the handle kind of a rally. But it's looking pretty good, except for Tesla down 0.6%. Everything, the big boys, and the bigger the square, the bigger the boy, uh, are up. That's probably sexist, right, that I call them the big boys. Uh, but there we are. You know, that we have to live with it sometimes. So let's jump straight into some real news here. And what I've been been talking about is that we were launching a newsletter and I sent some of you guys a, a sneak peek of it this morning and I'll show it to you here as well. So what we're going to do is not necessarily summarize these lives, but the, the content will be a bit different for sure, but give you that market update, give you a week's review and forecast, and then the kind of core stuff every day that is actually going to be important and useful and drive your portfolios and help you to better be, to trade better and to make better decisions and so on. Um, if you're not on our news list yet, go to felixfriends.org slash opt in and opt in for it. There'll be a free version and there'll be a premium version. We haven't built the back end to it yet. So um, for the moment, you'll be enjoying uh, certainly some amazing free content here. So uh, let's run through it a little bit. Like what actually happened last week? Well, Last week wasn't the greatest week for markets, at least not the way we ended it. And um, we lost about three and a half percentage points, right, on the on the S and P and the Nasdaq. Um, crude oil slumped eleven percent. I had a trade open on that, but I was building a piece of software which was automating my trades and decided to close all of my trades. Uh, software bug. Thank you very much. Um, there seem to be a few bugs in my life at the moment. The hot water is also cut out here. We've had three days of no boiler, which means very cold showers. The water is about nine degrees Celsius. That's about 40, I don't know, 47, 48 uh, Fahrenheit, which is a relatively cold temperature to be showering in. So imagine me jumping up and down and squealing while I shower every day. Uh, so gold is, is unchanged on the macro front. What have we got? We got um, the U.S. non-manufacturing PMI, that was more positive than expected. And some people think that's good news, but still, I think at the moment, good news is still bad news because it means the Fed has to do more. Jobless claims were pretty much in line, pretty, pretty steady. Uh, but the um, ointment arrived here on Friday with a core PPI for November uh, showing PPI data rose 0.4% double analyst expectations. And that's really what tanked the market for us, right? So what have we got to look forward to? So I am literally today here running through our newsletter because I thought we introduced it. The format will be a little different uh, going forward. It won't always be the same, exactly the same thing. But um, 
I think it'd be a useful place to, to look at. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind smashing the like button, we're missing about 160 of them here or, or, or so. Uh, that would be absolutely marvelous. And, and the link to this newsletter is, is down below. So sign up for it. Um, lots of really, really cool macro data out this week. We've got consumer price index. That's inflation, right? That's what that stands for. Inflation. Uh, that's coming out on Tuesday. We're expecting a 0.3%, basically flat, which will be okay. If it comes in a bit lower, the market will fly. If it comes in a bit higher, the market will borrow a deep, deep hole and, and, and just generally freak out. Uh, so on Wednesday, and I will be live streaming this, this is basically the highlight of my year. <laughs> it's the last Fed meeting of the year, the last FOMC meeting of the year. And it's not the rate decision. I always say that that's important because we kind of expect that to be 0.5%. But what we do want is a softish press conference afterwards. So there's about 30 minutes where Jay Powell doesn't just speak, but he gets asked questions. And sometimes these questions are a little hostile. And uh, that really is what, what drives the market here. Can you predict CPI based on PPI last week? Well, PPI was twice as high as we expected, right? So, you know, uh, that certainly is an issue for potentially if you want to, if you want to look at one towards the other, it would imply a higher CPI reading. Uh, Louis goes long and short. <laughs> Louis is basically market neutral, which is a good place to be. So a, a hawkish Powell may hammer the final nail in the Santa rhetoric, rhetoric here. Uh, so moving to Thursday, and, and yeah, there will be a Thursday. There will be live after the Fed meeting. It doesn't feel like it today, but there will be. We get Fed manufacturing data as well. We expect that to improve, and we also expect retail sales data to tank. Uh, so that's essentially what the market's looking for in expecting changes in that expectation will significantly impact the market. Short-term volatility is through the roof for the next nine days. So the market is expecting big moves, big, big moves. Uh, the bond yield curve is two-year, 10-year is kind of as inverted as it's ever been. Well, since the 1980s, literally since the 1980s, which is 40 years, 40 years. Uh, Reagan era yield curve inversion, and that's just screaming recession. Massive, massive recession uh, the market is expecting here. And therefore, the conversation in the new year, and I hope you still be watching me in the new year, uh, will be a lot around earnings, recessions, and so on here. Um, sorry, that's a little bit fuzzy. Personal savings rates in, in, in red here. So this is the savings rate. And that is really coming down here a lot. So if I can put in the horizontal line here so you can see where that's going, we are at 2005 levels. Um, while at the same time, consumer credit, which is the other line here, this is consumer credit. It's a probably a little higher resolution if you've got my email. Um, when that goes up like this, it normally comes down again at some point. It did that in 2008, right? It came down and it gave us some really, really big unpleasant uh, surprises there. So be, be, be wary of the macro here. Now, what about the positioning of big institutions and funds? And I, I find this to be one of the most useful bits of information for uh, positioning, investing, trading, and so on. And by the way, the link is down below if you want to get this kind of information every day delivered into your inbox, uh, then please do. Someone's calling me, um, probably to say how marvelous our new newsletter is looking, right? Uh, so we've had all this bullishness throughout October, November, in a sense, and that was driven by funds being very short. So they didn't really have much money in the market. And then these kind of um, chasing funds, the CTAs, uh, they are now, they purchased 175 billion and are now basically net long. What does that mean? It means they've bought. They've got less buying to do. So it doesn't really support a rally as much, if anything, as a potential for them to start selling again. Uh, so Goldman Sachs uh, saying increasing downside potential if these positions are unwound, estimating a, a, as much as 155 billion, 155 billion, which is almost the same amount they put into the market, could be triggered by an extreme downturn. So an extremely hawkish Fed could trigger an extremely nasty December surprise. 
Uh, Nomura is saying 3906 is the first trigger for them selling. And the buy trigger sits at 4116. And that's quite a high, quite a high level, isn't it? 4116 versus 3906. So, you know, we closed at 3934. So you can see we are much, much closer to the sell trigger here. The sell trigger is 3906, whereas the buy trigger is 4116. Uh, and, and therefore, risk is to the downside here. So I would I would definitely bear that in mind um, with that. Um, and we have been, and we've making some nice money with that. We are up 144% on our options portfolio this year. I've, I've shared every single one of these trades with you guys, either on a live stream or um, I pinged you in the community. So feel free to come and learn how we do it, exactly how it works. And that's not me promising you the exact same return. I think that would not be honest. Uh, but what I can promise you is that I share with you absolutely every bit of my process and thinking and strategy and, and everything else. So jump on it, uh, check it out. Book a call with us at felixfriends.org slash coaching if you have a five-figure portfolio or more, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, also don't hurt. Uh, if you're just starting out, we have a course as well, a pre-recorded course. It's 100 lessons plus. You get to watch me trade live every week. So you don't just get the theory, you get the strategy, and then you see me actually implementing it. And I think it's those three components that you need to have together. Honestly, I've bought some options books of late because people always ask me what's a great book to learn, options trading. And yeah, they just tell you theory. And it's you read it and you're like, that's technically correct. And now what? What do I do, right? And, and, and that's always what I set out to make very, very different with our program. So, so links are also down in the description here. Um, now, positioning here, this is again a screenshot from uh, Global Markets. Goldman's are saying exactly that, what I, what I just summarized here. So the, the short-term levels, 3914 or 3906 is sort of like where they start selling around that level, which is only about 20 points below where we are right now um where are we on the es1 let me see if it's up to date yet let me look on the minute es1 by the way apologies that's the future of the s p so it's still 10 minute delayed for me i don't know why okay i need to talk to trading view uh, but yeah it's it's heading down a little bit here today we're trading around three nine seven eight on the on the futures and the SPX closed at, what happened here? Why do we have news down there? At 3934. So some nice green bounce pre-market here for sure. And um, the selling on Friday basically was a neutral market. And I think that's always a really important thing to look at. End of day, look at the big volume. That's institutions trading. And you can see not a lot happening. Pretty, pretty flat positioning, which is exactly what we're seeing here. So uh, that's precisely what the charts are saying here. Um, a, the trigger, as I repeat here again, because I think these are important, 3906. Uh, we hope we don't close below 3930 today. You might see a little bit of panic unwinding at the end of today because people are expecting the inflation data to be out tomorrow. Uh, Andrea shouting out about Neo. I literally just recorded a Neo video on exactly that. It'll come out after this. Brilliant news. Absolutely brilliant news. Neo look to be delivering about 26,000 vehicles in December. I mean, that's my, my estimate on, on that basis, which looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, so I will go through all of your questions, so please feel free to ask them. Um, I will only answer them, though, if you've already hit the like button. <laughs> I can't tell, unfortunately. I wish I could, and I could throw tomatoes at people who don't hit the like button. Uh, and you could throw tomatoes back at me. Wouldn't that be a nice little invention? So like, Felix, get to the point. Let's get to the point. China reopening. What's going on here? So we've had massive, massive upside on, the, on China, right? We're up 80% from the lows on China, plus 80%. The KWEB, the most loathed ETF of the beginning of the year, has actually outperformed the S&P, which is pretty insane. Um, but bear in mind, we are very much overbought on the KWEB. Now, you can be overbought and you can keep rallying. A very strong rally continues with overbought levels. But um, it's gone a lot up. So it's possibly a little late to jump in on the trade. That's the way I'd look at that. Here is a lovely, pretty chart. And you can see just 
just how much we've gone up by, right? That whole thing there is 83 whopping percentage points, which is marvelous. And then down here is the RSI looking rather overboard um, or heading in that direction as well. Barber has also, our beloved Barber, Barber, what have they done to you? It's also gone up 60% in the last five weeks. So really nice recovery here. It's $92. I know it's not 220, but you know, it is at least heading in the right direction. But again, same theory applies. Like, are we protest po possibly um, overbought here on that one again? Um, oil, not so slick is the headline. This is from our newsletter if you just joined in. Links down below if you wish to join it. We are going to be launching this officially in the next few days. I sent a couple of you guys a, a sneak preview this morning. And um, we've seen some significant outflows already, which is kind of what we've been thinking. I set up a trade on oil about 10, 10 days ago, a week ago, which uh, my uh, software app killed. <laughs> it's meant to close trades at certain risk levels. So that I can be, you know, out and about sipping a coffee somewhere. And if a trade gets particularly risky, it'll just take a small loss and close the trade. And I'll live happily ever after sipping my cappuccino. But it decided that all my trades were risky. Uh, so it basically uh, was the AI going mad. And uh, yeah, therefore, my oil trade is closed. I might set it up again on Wednesday. But let's see what the data comes in uh, so far. So uh, basically, hedge funds are unwinding their oil positions how could you trade it? Well, I think uh, OXY is a way to trade it. Possibly XOM is also a way to trade it. I'm not saying that you should, of course. I definitely wait out the inflation data tomorrow and the Fed data tomorrow. But we're getting to a point here, which is that's the 200-day moving average line. And you break through that, it becomes pretty bearish usually. Although in December 2021, it was the, the kickoff for the real rally. But I think from a macro point of view, falling demand and so on, uh, there is a significant downside risk here at, at the moment. But if it goes back over the 200 days, so just dip below it, if it goes above it again, that's very, very bullish. So watch out for those line, lines. Exxon is another way of, of looking at it. Um, Again, possibly going from its sort of 103 down to about 93, which is, again, its 200-day moving average line. So that's the sort of thing that I would look for as a potential trade. We bounced off it a few times this year. And um, typically, these things are, are a fairly decent indicator. Um, if you are interested in how we actually set up these trades and what actually makes them 80% probability trades and how I only spend about three hours a week trading uh, and get you know 144% up so far this year on capital invested, uh, there is a free trading script which you can get your hands on. All you got to do is go here, felixfriends.org slash FB group. FB group. Uh, felixfriends.org slash FB group. It's completely free. Uh, it's in our Facebook group and, and you, we'll send it to you. Uh, so check it out. Um, and, and you get a real insight. I think it's a six-page PDF that I wrote on exactly all the steps that I take to look for trades, identify trades, and so on. Anybody into gold? Any gold investors? Well, let me. I was just reading some some comments here. I will. I will uh, go through your questions in a second. Uh, provided that the likes go to 200. Otherwise, I will sulk and I will run away. I'd love it if you guys smash that like button. I appreciate it. Um, now, China and Russia are buying a ton of gold for two reasons. China doesn't really want to put all of its money into US, US treasuries. It sort of doesn't really make sense in terms of geopolitics at the moment. And Russia isn't allowed to move its money out of the country. So what can they do? Well, Russia is one of the biggest gold miners in the world, and therefore they can just buy their own gold, um, which is a nice asset to have as a, as, a, as a government or central bank. So we've seen these massive central bank gold purchases here, and we'd expect that to be probably mostly China, and, and, and now Russia being added to it, literally 400 tons, their unexpected purchases, which is pretty significant. Look at the history, right? So this goes back to 2009. So what does that mean for gold? Does it mean put all your money into gold, bury it in the backyard and, and, and you know, sell everything kind of thing? Well, 
we are seeing, as it says, here, the 200 day moving average line is at 1792. It has basically put breaks on the rally. So it's not really moving that much around it. It's sort of bobbing along around the 1800 mark, possibly. A Fed meeting on Wednesday could make or break the rally. So a do dovish, dovish, I never know which one it is. Fed could send gold much higher. Um, in contrast, a hawkish Fed could force some liquidation and, and bring gold back down to sort of 1700, 12, 1718, or, or, or there we go. And it's pretty hard to expect which way that's going to go. So I wouldn't trade something that's really hard to figure out. Um, now, the volatility on gold is, however, and this is a little bit beyond maybe non-options traders, is super low. It's 16%. That's the IV percent of gold. So what does that mean? Actually, buying options on gold is really cheap, really, really cheap. So straddles, strangles, that sort of thing, uh, possible. Um, anything that's basically long um, gold could certainly be, be something, something to look at. So uh, here's some gold charts. We move past them. If you guys want to get them, um, again, just, just subscribe to the free newsletter. Um, it, there will be a free and there'll be a, be a, a premium version, I think. Uh, as we expand that out. The guys, I, I send it to some of you today. I, I'd love your feedback on it. I'd love to like know what you would love to see in it, what you're missing, what you didn't like, what you what you loved and so on. And of course, I'll blame Elliot for all the bits that I we didn't like, that you didn't like. Um, we're at 118 likes so far. We're still missing about 230. So if you'd like me to answer your question, I'd love it if you, the, the, the threat doesn't really work, does it? Well, so maybe, you know, Winston would be incredibly happy if you smashed the like button. Now he's getting desperate now. He gets two more likes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, now, in a nutshell, which is perhaps how we should end every video, but don't worry, we have, we have a bit more time. Recession fears and receding inflows are going to dampen sentiment, I think, going into 2023. Oil, not quite sure what's going to happen there. Um, we might get some supply-side shocks are possible with geopolitics and so on. Although at the moment, I, I would say oil is heading more likely downwards than upwards. But, um, you know, you, you never really quite quite know. The Yeah, but stocks like Oxy and, and Xom look fairly richly priced. I think it's a nice way of putting at it. So, you know, you could do some things via bear calls or bearish long IV structures or so on, long put butterfly stuff like that. And that might be like, what the heck does that all mean? Well, it's it's sort of aimed for people who know a little bit about options already. If you don't, um, I'll, I'll tell you how you can learn in a second. Um, gold might be a nice trade in terms in, in, in um, just before the Fed meeting, and I might set up something like that today. I'll let you guys know you in the community, as I always do. But the first rule of trading, and I think this is, if there's only one sentence I'd like to take away from this, is the first rule of trading or investment is capital preservation. Opportunities are endless, but our capital is not. So unless it's a really good one, don't do it because the risk is still there and, and you know, take that into account. And that's generally what we've done. When did I this year set up trades that were particularly where there is an unknown risk? So at one point this year, I set up trades just the Tuesday before the, the Wednesday FOMC meeting. And you know what happened that month? I lost 11% that month. So don't do it. It's not smart. And why did I do that? I've had such a good run. I got a little overconfident, and that happens to the worst of us uh, at times. But you know, we we we're doing pretty well. We're up 144 percent on the year so far. So check out our coaching program if you have a five-figure plus six, seven, eight, nine-figure portfolio at felixfriends.org/slash coaching. Give us a call. We'll walk you through it. And if you're just starting out, absolutely brilliant. The most important place to be. Uh, go to felixfriends.org/slash options and access our 100 plus lecture course watch me trade live every single week and the coupon code there is guarantee that expires it says on the 11th but for some reason it's actually expiring at the end of today so go to felix friends at options and, and check that out and if you haven't already opted in for the newsletter too Felix Friends at Oxlash opt in. We will be launching this formally in the next few days. As I said, I sent out the first version of it today, which is pretty much, well, it's exactly what I just ran you through. And 
the YouTube videos and the newsletters won't always be the same because that would be silly. Uh, but um, if you want to get that kind of weekly insight of what actually happened and what is about to happen, there's some ideas around possible things one could trade and then a daily update on of what's really driving the market, the, the numbers to look for, the events to look for, what institutions are doing, how are they positioned, are they long, are they short, what's the risk, is it up, is it down, is it sideways, is it a backflip, uh, then this is the place to, to go. Felix Spencer, Rock slash Optin. Now, let me see if we've got any questions here. If you ask some, please repeat them in the chat and I will, I will be easier for me to find them. Uh, what are you guys talking about? Gold. Oh, brilliant. You're buying gold. Nice. Um, audio engineers. What are you guys talking about? Um, Sinistar. Cool. You do earnings streaming. Brilliant. That's really nice. I'd love to have a chat with you at some point. Drop me, drop me a line if you like. Okay, um, questions here. Harsha, opinion on bank stocks, please specifically back down 10% last week. Okay, let's have a look at back. BAC, this is a minute chart, so it looks a little mad. It's up a little pre-market. Ooh, crikey, what happened there? Wow, that's significant. More significant than, let me just put an SPX over it. Yeah, I mean, it fell along with the S&P, but more significantly. Well, I suppose the, the question is with banks, you know, banks like Bank of America and JP Morgan, you've got massive, massive deposits, make a lot of money out of higher interest rates. So they get higher interest rates on the government and they don't pass them on because their customers are... I don't know, too lazy to change banks or something. So that's where they make a lot of money from. So in a sense, they like higher higher um, interest rates. So I think that's something to do with this is how long are these rates going to stay this high? Because that'll influence how much money they make. And then at the same time, if you worry about the real economy, recession means what? Some of the people they've lent money to are not going to pay. They're going to go out of business. People are not going to invest as much. They're not going to use as many financial services. There'll be less M&A activity, at least at the beginning of a recession, and then it picks up again. Uh, so less advisory work, less fees, and so on. So banks are kind of in this, like, I think we've already priced in the high interest rates, and now we've got this, like, recession problem here. So I personally never invest in banks because I don't understand them. I don't think banks understand banks, and the regulator certainly doesn't understand banks. If you look at their uh, you know, credit default swap portfolio and stuff like that, I think every single bank in the world could individually go bust tomorrow. They will get bailed out, sure, but I don't really like that unpredictability. And in the long run, I think they have rarely, really performed. I mean, let's look at, look at a month chart here just to get a bit of a feel for and how long back we can go. You know, we're still trading below 2008 levels. So we're talking about that this morning, actually, in the, in the coaching community, how the banks have never really recovered from the 2008 financial crisis. Um, they just haven't. So, you know, this was a pretty horrific investment, isn't it? I mean, even if you bought this in like 1982 or something, which was a pretty low point, how much money would you have made? 31, no, okay, 22,200%, which isn't, isn't bad, but you would have probably done much better than the index, I would have thought. Let me look at the S&P. Uh, and of course, past performance and all that, you know, not a guarantee, but where are we right now? We're uh, here. So yeah, you would have done 50% better with buying the S&P, which isn't the world's greatest index either. So that's sort of my take on, on Bank of America there. Uh, right, let me just see here questions. Uh, SLV, uh, yeah, you can trade SLV for sure. Yeah, don't, I, I really wouldn't trade the unpredictable Sinistar. Um, and a CPI reading is just unpredictable. You have no special insight unless, you know, your cousin is a statistician or something, in which case they're probably go to jail soon. So, 
yeah, I, I wouldn't don't trade the unpredictable. It's just not, it's just that's just gambling. Late the party, Margaret. Good morning to you. The Microsoft deal and ATV is blocked. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's it's not over to the fat lady things. I think that's one part of it, that they will obviously appeal this and litigate and all of that. And I mean, Activision in itself is a is a it's a pretty solid business. So I don't think they need to be owned by Microsoft to make a success of it. So okay, they're trading below the beginning of 2021 highs, which was about 95, but you know, not, not too badly. That's just the market broadly. So yeah, I don't think it really matters. And then as for Microsoft, well, it also hasn't really hurt them very much. Sorry, very big green bars. And why is that? Because generally speaking, big M&A doesn't really work. Like it doesn't really pay dividends. It's very, very hard to integrate big mergers. And usually the really smart people leave and, and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of big m and I think the market broadly isn't either. Are you going to close your positions? Just John. Well, John, if you looked on the on the, on the the Discord, um, I pinged you guys on, I think, last Wednesday or Thursday. Um, this, tra this app I'm working on, which is basically going to close all of our positions when they get particularly risky on its own, it closed all of my positions, including the ones that weren't risky. So my portfolio is empty. And uh, I, I looked briefly on Friday, but I couldn't really find anything. And it kind of doesn't make sense to set up trades just before inflation data and, and FOMC meetings. Let me see if there are any questions here. Good morning. What are your opinion on Tesla? I, I never really have much an opinion on Tesla, to be honest with you. I know everybody does. I don't really. I never really have because it just seems to be driven so much by the tweet frequency of, L, of of Elon, right? So, I mean, they make a great product and all that. It's just a question of, of uh, what is the reasonable valuation for Tesla? I can't really tell you. Microsoft bought 4% of the London Stock Exchange. Did they really? Okay. They're trying to get into the fintech game, are they? Would it be prudent to just not open any positions next couple of days? I'm not going to do anything till Wednesday, basically, until after the Fed speaks. Because you've got two massive events in CPI and, 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 um, and uh, the Fed decision. What's the world's greatest index? It really depends on what you're looking for. I mean, the big indices like SPX and stuff like that, I mean, they are certainly very useful, but 500 stocks, are there 500 great American listed businesses? I very much doubt it. Um, I mean, something like this might be a little better. It's not financial advice, SPHQ, because it's got more the quality stocks in it. Um, so I, I would I would always err more on, on, on something like that, which is a little bit of a smaller index. Felix was late to the Tesla party. I, I, I've never it was never even at the Tesla party. I wasn't invited. Uh, you can certainly trade banks, Margaret. Nothing wrong with that. I was just talking about a sort of a long hold. Sinistral, I'm with you on that. Like after we see them, the, the reactions, which could be significant or nothing at all of inflation and then the Fed meeting, uh, we will at least know whether there'll be 155 billion of selling or not. And that will have a pretty good, pretty big impact. Like all the algo flows of the last three, four weeks were about 170 billion. And you can see what that's done to the market, right? We've had this beautiful rally here. So why would I want to like bet against that potentially. I, I definitely don't want to do that. Um, do you trade Forex? Not much, to be honest with you. Um, some of my coaches do, but um, I'm not a big Forex guy. I think it's an interesting space. It's something we're looking at as well a bit more. I'm always lo looking at diversification. And I think it, ideally you would trade stocks, commodities, Forex, bonds, um, macro, and the long quality portfolio. I think that's kind of 
and real estate and maybe a bit of PE. Uh, I think that will be kind of the ideal setup. So that's sort of what we are what we're thinking of doing here. Hasha, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, Hasha, have a look at my top holdings. It's on the Discord. Uh, if you look at the portfolio there, and then I, I would look at broadly ROIC or ROCE. I'd look at gross margins. I'd look at long-term earnings per share growth. And then I'd you know, know whether or not 15% was realistic. FX, you'd like to learn more about it. Yeah, we're literally thinking about doing something exactly like that. Um, we just want to always make sure, I'm always very mindful of teaching something that actually I think genuinely works and that has a relatively moderate risk profile. I mean, there's a risk in everything, right? I mean, you buy an SPX share today, there's a risk in it. Uh, but so I don't want to be out there and say, hey, trade FX with us, make a million percent by tomorrow. Like, that's not what I want to do. So we just want to make sure that it can be very retail friendly and that people with smallish portfolios can actually continue consistently make money out of it. Uh, George, uh, TLT, I sort of feel the trade is done. I kind of feel like been there, done that. And I think if you join now, you're too late to the party, unless you want to trade it down. But I, again, wouldn't do that before uh, Fed meeting, because that's what's going to really drive this one. Uh, Forex is foreign exchange. So dollar versus euro, dollar versus yen, dollar versus sterling, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, are you participating in IPOs? I'm not a huge IPO fan. Um, a little bit of private equity, which often t lends, lends itself towards an IPO. But um, I'm not really a big IPO buyer. Um, I, I don't really believe in buying IPOs. And, and Adam, you're quite right. Like there are significant risks. You just have to, you have to do it right. I mean, like with everything, right? People do options really wrong and they lose their shirt because they're doing it really wrong. But if you really understand that you can make a lot of money, just like foreign exchange uh, traders at big banks are usually very profitable and very, very highly paid. I like, guess a chap I went to school with and he started as a, he's a very, very smart math brain. Um, and I think within two or three years of being at the bank, he was easily making a million, a million a year as a very junior trader. So, you know, there's some serious money in this space, but you need to know how it works. Um, can we see some bull moves if inflation comes under control? I think, Baron, it's a great question. I think tomorrow we'll be, the reaction to the inflation might be a little bit more muted. Um, but if, say, inflation comes in much lower than the 0.3%, 0.4% month on month we're expecting, then the Fed will have data that will give them an excuse to be softer, right? So I think maybe I should actually backtrack that. Tomorrow, if the data move is big, it'll make the Fed decision less important because we know what they're going to say. But if it's just flat, exactly what we expect it to be, then the market will be jittery tomorrow and wait for what Papa Powell says on Wednesday. Um, Margaret, I pre appreciate that. Uh, look, I mean, there's only fun teaching people something that you know really works. And, uh, you know, I, I, I always say, I, I can't promise you that I may, you'll, you'll make 144% on your capital invested like, like I've done so far this year because you're not me, and I don't encourage copy trading, which would obviously be one way to achieve it. Uh, but I can say to you, A, I'll do every one of these trades live, or I'll ping you immediately as I do them. And secondly, I'll show you the exact process, the exact structure, the, the rules I have for exit and entry, and so on. And again, none of that is a guarantee, but I can just show you completely transparently what I do and actually teach it to you and within our coaching community. You know, we run like four live calls every week, group calls. Um, we answer millions of questions on chats and live one-on-ones every single week. And by going through the trades with you and actually explaining them to you and, and really running through what the heck is going on here, um, I think people get some serious experience and people get some serious 
upside uh, relatively quickly. But you know, I can't promise you returns will be illegal to do. And that's part of the way the financial industry is regulated. They don't really want new people in the space, right? I mean, I think that might sound a little bit conspiratorial, but I think that's that's one that's got something to do with it. It's just they just like you to run to your financial advisor. Um, nothing wrong with running to your financial advisor, but most financial advisors aren't particularly great. Like most fund managers underperform the market 95% of the time, yet they don't get fired, right? So you kind of think, why don't they get fired? Because the clients like you and me, most people don't know where to put their money. They don't know what's a better fund. They don't know the better fund manager. So they're kind of stuck. And I kind of really what, what my aim is to help you be unstuck and help you actually be able to make smart decisions based on things you understand rather than on a bunch of charts and data and numbers that someone's showing you and then you go like, oh, I don't really know. Well, you deal with it, right? So, um, but I want to very say very clearly, if you come here to like just copy trade and just copy what I'm doing, then that's really, you're really in the wrong place because that's not really what I'm about. I, I want to teach you uh, how to fish. And I say that as someone who's been plant-based for about 30 years. Um, rather than just telling you do this, do that specific trade. That's not really the idea. But again, like with our newsletter, we're going to give you some trading themes. We're going to give you some ideas and that might be useful to you. And if you understand what's going on, you'll be able to assess the risk and make decisions yourself. Um, uh, John, I appreciate that very much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, the cucumber carrot protocol, indeed. I mean, that's the, that's the biggest thing that Wall Street's missing out on, right? They haven't got Winston. Uh, John, I appreciate that. Um, I, I'll aim to be a little earlier tomorrow uh, as we get that key data coming in. Oleg, big question. Is inflation going to come in lower? The warning bell is the wage increases we saw last week. And that didn't say wage spiral, but it was higher than expected. And what's the biggest component of CPI inflation, it's services, right? Goods and energy and all that stuff, it's a relatively small part of it. Services is the big deal. So if wages keep going up, we might have an unpleasant surprise there. But I, I, I don't make predictions on CPI data. I just see it as a storm ahead. And I think, well, sail back to the marina, have a nice drink and let the storm pass and then pounce after that. Uh, Louisa, much appreciated. Thanks for tuning in. Harsha says, could you chart analyze SPY? Okay, we never look at SPY. I don't normally look at SPI, I normally look at SPX, but we can certainly do that. So there's an SPY day chart. So fair bit of support, pretty much exactly where the low was yesterday, right? Around that 393. Let me make that a little bit bigger for you. Why do I say that? Because if you drew a line here where the low was yesterday, you can see the day before ended pretty much the same. And here, that one and that one and this one, you know, there are quite a few sort of support points, uh, I, I would say, around that 393 mark or thereabouts. No moving average, though. But look at a FIB. Fibonacci is, no, Fibonacci is quite a lot lower. Fibonacci is at 386, so that doesn't really help. So support here indeed, but for me, the institutional flows are more important. So if we do drop a little here, probably to 391 or 390, you get mother of all sell-offs from the CTAs and and pretty much potentially the same amount that was, was brought in here since October. So at the moment, there's a downside risk, but we don't know what the Fed's going to say. We don't know what the inflation reading is going to say tomorrow. So that's, I think, going to be the catalyst to move us up or down. Uh, bike, absolutely. I'll live stream uh, Jay Powell's press conference because that's the biggest event that's going to happen here this year. Um, Sinistar, minus 70% average downside risk on the indices. Uh, I haven't done that number, but you're probably reasonably right. We are very close to the trigger where they start selling off, right? And that's, if you look at a a SPX, that's usually why I have them here. Um, 
yeah, they, the buy trigger might have moved up a bit and the sells trigger is, I think, around 3920 or 3910 or something like that. Just do a poll for the CPI to see what the rest of the people think. Um, yep, sure, we can do that. Let me pop, pop it a quick poll out here. CPI will be lower than expected, higher than expected. Okay, let me pop that out here. Poll is out. Do your worst and let us know what you, what you guys think. So the CPI, if I apologize, that's, that stands for inflation, consumer price index. So it's inflation. So far, some of you go 55% so far, I think it's going to be higher than expected. So we have a, we have a cautious audience here, but we only have 22 votes. So not the greatest, not the greatest. Uh... Oh, expected, Toby. Okay, you think it's going to be much higher. Okay, so, so far, more of you guys think it's going to be higher than lower, which would mean you know, a proper sell-off. Without doubt, higher, says Ian. Okay, interesting. I I'm surprised how um, kind of hawkish you are on that. Uh, but yeah, good to see. I uh, appreciate you you sharing. Um, thank you, Oleg, for the, for the suggestion. If you haven't already gotten your fingers onto our brand new flashing newsletter, which will give you institutional grade news and data points directly into your inbox. Go to feedlytrends.org slash opt-in and sign up for that. And expect the worst and all the surprises are pleasant, says Kyle. I, I like that. I like your optimism. Let me see if you missed anything here. No, brilliant. Thank you very much for tuning in, guys. I wish you a beautiful trading day and I'll be seeing you tomorrow for inflation data, hopefully, and on Wednesday for Fed data life and Winston and I say uh, have a beautiful day see you on the next one